See, if the sun is shining, we've got to be able to bring that voltage down either in an emergency or also. Hey, this is Joel Walsman, CEO and Master Electrician of Jefferson Electric. Caution, if you're a homeowner, a DIYer, you're already in over your head. Watch out. This project is a residential rooftop solar array on a detached accessory structure. This is one of the more than 100 solar projects that Jefferson Electric completed in the state of Indiana. This view is a typical representation of a site plan that would be submitted to the authority that has jurisdiction, the local permit office, and the utility for interconnection agreement and permitting purposes. As you can see, all the major components of the solar array have been clearly identified on the plan and serve as the official record for future reference, design, engineering, and permitting. We typically come out in force and knock out projects start to finish in a single day. Customer was kind enough to let us utilize his toys. In fact, a lot of times customers want to have a sense of ownership and participation in a project. That is not the least bit uncommon. My advice to you is if you can do it safely, you will improve the quality of their experience because now they feel like they contributed. This is their solar array. This is Zach, one of our lead electricians operating the Kubota today. Zach grew up on a farm and became comfortable with heavy equipment at an early age. He's a real asset to our team. On the left is Delbert. Delbert learned his electrical skills in the military and has come with such a professional attitude and a meek and quiet spirit. Really a beautiful person. One of the things I get really picky about personally is staging materials. You always want to handle materials as few times as possible. As the old saying goes, how many times does firewood heat you? Three times. When you cut it, when you split it, when you burn it. We do not want that to be the case on our job sites. Take the materials, stage them in the optimal location that they will not be in the path of any other item, any other process that needs to take place. They're not going to be in the way of in, in harm's way, in the, in the trench path, and yet the same token as close as possible to the point of utilization. The same is true of rails. You only want to handle the rails once or twice when on the ground, if at all possible, before completing the prefab and sending them to the roof. Now, often if weather is inclement, we'll do prefab at the shop to minimize the amount of time that we're spending outdoors in the snow or the rain. But in this case, it's a spacious area. It's a beautiful day. And so our team members, Bruce here in the foreground, is laying out the Iron Ridge rails. Iron Ridge is our preferred product. It does make solar stronger. We believe in you, Iron Ridge. And it's very user-friendly. We've seen Iron Ridge reduce parts counts dramatically and simplify and improve installation for installers over the last four years in a dramatic way. Good for you guys. Safety gear. It's time to get it on. Get it properly snugged up. First man to the roof isn't wearing a rope until those attachment points are secured. But after that, everybody's tied in all the time. We will be routing a trench a long distance between the detached accessory structure and the view here back to the house. The trench will be over 150 feet. The commander of the trench is Porfirio. Porfirio came to Jefferson Electric from landscaping. He's got extensive experience in heavy equipment and earth moving. He does it with joy and pride. In this case, we'll be utilizing a direct burial cable between the house and the barn. A direct burial cable in these conditions needs to be covered with a minimum of 24 inches of earth. That's code minimum found in table 300.5. Bruce is utilizing the Iron Ridge splice kits to combine rails to achieve the overall length of the array, securing the ladder. I get pretty picky about my ladders. You want to have the proper inclination on the ladder. You want to have the ladder properly secured at the gutter. You want to have the ladder extending a minimum of three feet above the gutter. And properly secured can look like a couple of different things. What I've done here is I've utilized two screws, the holes of which I'm going to caulk later and I've secured a two by four into the fascia of the barn. My ladder is not damaging the edge of the metal roof and I'm gonna slip a stout strap through that two by four between the two by four and fascia between the screws and I'm gonna secure the ladder so that it doesn't have latitude to move left or right on us. We're gonna have dozens of entries and exits from the roof. We wanna make sure it's secure, there's no shifting, it's fully safe. 
First thing on the roof, installation of the safety points. I took a look on the underside of the barn to understand what the framing looks like. And the framing is on edge underneath each one of these ribs. I cannot install my safety points on top of these ribs with the exposed fasteners. So what I'm going to utilize is the blocking that's around the cupola. I've identified that the blocking is accessible out from the edge of the cupola, and I'm going to nail my safety points into that blocking. This is a permanent attachment point for the solar array. We're going to have one per team member who's working on the roof, and we must secure it to framing using the supplied nails. Take a look at your manufacturer's instructions regarding installation of the safety point. I highly recommend it. We always, as a policy and a practice, install safety points standard on every rooftop solar array. And we don't install the temporary kind, we go with the permanent. So there will always be multiple safety points left behind on the roof, properly sealed, watertight, and caulked. The framing allowed for a very narrow window of attachment. So I had to toenail the nails into the cupola blocking. And then I used additional self-tapping screws to secure the attachment to the roof, not so much from a structural standpoint, but from a waterproofing standpoint. I lost my butyl tape, so I had to pull some off the trailer. Butyl tape has been in the roofing industry for a long time. It's a um, well-known commercial roofing product, and it's going to create the longest lasting weathertight seal. Do not depend on caulk a weather tight seal caulk alone I should specify on a roof it's not gonna last you'll notice that Jefferson Electric prefers ropes as opposed to the retractable steel tethers that's an intentional decision that comes from a cost to adaptability equation okay so we actually have had three team members fall through before it's not pretty uh, thankfully two of them were wearing harnesses one stopped right at the edge and just over the roof, and literally feet were dangling two, dangling two stories in the air. He was pretty shaken up and uh, got immediately down off the roof after some assistance. Um, you're, you're pretty well trapped when you're hanging off the edge of the roof, um, full body weight suspended by the harness. Second team member did actually go completely off the edge of the roof and then swung gently to the ground. It was like six, six eight feet to the ground. And by the time he came to rest, his feet were literally on the ground and he was still suspended in the harness in part. Uh, but the third time, it was also a low roof. <laughs> but with no safety implementation uh, was present, the team member was out in the, by themselves servicing a solar array and they fell off the roof and their head barely missed smacking an air conditioner. They landed flat on their back in the bushes. And uh, <laughs> I do think if nobody if they had hit the air conditioner and nobody had found them because nobody was around, nobody was home, the vultures probably would have gotten to them first. Not pretty. Wear your safety. Okay, so right now we're doing a roof layout. We know the dimensions, the outside dimensions of the array. We've done the simulation. We know our max span, max cantilever. And um, as soon as we have the overall plot of the array to the roof, we can start securing our attachment points according to the uh, they're just gonna be like, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> visual center, visual center, guys. Don't forget the visual center. We are finding the visual center of the roof. The visual center of this roof is the center between the cupolas. We're gonna take all of our measurements off of that center mark, and that's gonna allow the array to look aesthetically pleasing and balanced on the rooftop. Because this is a detached, residential accessory structure, firemen will not get on the roof in order to cut holes and provide ventilation in the event of a fire, but we still want some perimeter around the array itself for safe serviceability. If we butt those modules right to the edge, then it's very difficult to access and it requires removal of more modules in order to get to the solar module and question if that should be located at the edge of the array. Notice that our attachment points have been staggered across the roof. That's a very intentional effort. What we want is to distribute the load across the roof and all of its structural elements. It's going to be like falling water, and that's what we're dialoguing here is we need to be conscious that we don't exceed max cantilever. Cantilever is the element from the edge of the rail to the first attachment point. Span is between attachment points. This array has been engineered and we have a firm dimension 
That's based upon the wind zone, the rail type, the module type, the attachment type, and all other considerations that define a max cantilever and a max span. So within those constraints, we're going to stagger our attachments across the roof in order to distribute the load, both wind load, which is an upload, and snow load, which is a download. Notice those pitch hoppers, those little guys that are foam and stick to the roof and provide a, a stable and balanced surface. Those things are worth their weight in gold. Love them. These attachments are really interesting. It's the first time I've utilized them, and I'll tell you what's going on here. There's a butyl seal on the inside of the attachment that is waterproofing the penetration that the screw, the self-tapping screw, is making through the roof. There are a total of four screws that need to be balanced that secure the total bracket. If there's, you know, one screw is too low on one side, it brings the screw on the other side up, and it creates a crooked attachment point. Now, a little bit of crooked is real doable, but I want to make sure that the attachment is well seated to the rib of the roof such that we get that waterproofing we're looking for. This should be a solid 25 year product. Alright, so as you can see here we have intentionally staggered our starting points at the beginning of the array. We do have a design limitation in that the maximum cantilever from the first attachment point to the end of the rail, which you'll see in a minute, is three feet two inches. That's specific to the hardware and equipment that we're using, as well as the size of the rail, the wind region, the snow region. Everything's been taken into consideration for that dimension, three foot two. And so all of our starting attachment points have been staggered within the design parameter of max cantilever, three feet two inches. And what we're going to do is intentionally distribute the load of the array. That's the rails, the hardware, the panels, as well as dead loads like snow loads and live loads like wind loads across the structural roof. Because if we lined up all of our attachment points, we would convey all stress from the array, dead loads and live loads, to that one structural member underneath those attachment points. So the, uh, the stagger is intentional. It's not chaos. It's a design consideration. At this point, the trench is completely dug, and it's a beautiful trench. We're not worried about the contours of the trench because we're not using direct burial pipe. We're using direct burial wire. You have to make sure the rating for the wire to be in the soils underground, otherwise there will be deterioration and failure. Going to be mindful of two pro tips here. During backfill, we want to be very mindful of the stones and objects that come down on top of the wire. We do not want any sharp or abrasive object to be in direct contact with the wire. So we're going to use the loose fill and we're going to rake it on top of the wire in order to protect it. And then other stones and, and objects will be put um, on top of the trench or higher up in the trench separated by the loose fill. There's Cameron down on his hands and his knees. Look at that. That's the kind of guy you're looking for. Making it happen, capping. Secondly, during the final stage of fill, when we're about 12 inches from the surface, we're going to install a caution direct buried electric line tape. It's a durable ribbon or tape. It's not just regular caution tape, which would deteriorate in the soil. We're going to install that in the trench to avoid damaging the installation. Bruce is making tracks, installing the optimizers. The optimizers are held on by a stainless steel T-bolt. There is a star washer. The star washer is inserted between the rail and the optimizer, and that is for the purpose of creating that UL listed grounding path. It bites through the anodization of the rail into the aluminum, and it creates a solid electrical connection. It also serves as a lock washer to avoid having the nut spin off, but its primary purpose is to ensure the integrity of the grounding path. Matt, Porphy, Marcus, they're labeling the end of the wire and the spool itself. We're going to pull all the strings through the trench and in addition we're going to pull a spare future string. If there should be underground failure, the last thing we want to do is have to trench again. We'll have a spare black and a spare red. Black is negative, red is positive, and that will allow for expansion or repair if anything should take place. Rather than pulling the cable or the individual wires through the trench, we pull them on top of the trench to minimize resistance. We can keep an eye on what's taking place, and then once we have the proper length, we'll drop them into the trench and commence backfilling. 
Drew began apprenticing with Jefferson Electric in high school. He has completed four years of ABC. Drew is mindfully establishing the inverter layout. So next is mounting the inverters over here. We have three in inverters. Um, each of them are 14 and a half inches across and we need to have eight inches of spacing in between them. So I added that up, it's gonna be 59 and a half inches. So you know what you wanna do if you haven't worked with an inverter technology before or any major component of this array is you wanna spend an hour, sit down, read through the installation manual. You'll find a couple nuggets that are worth their weight in gold. So one of the things Drew's being mindful of here is he is gonna provide enough separation between the inverters that they're properly dissipating heat and not voiding the warranty. There's the heat sink. Look at that. Beautiful. Gotta let those babies breathe. The efficiency improves as the temperature decreases. That's true of the inverters as well as PV, photovoltaic, the solar panels themselves. Drew's got a plan. We're gonna check back in to see how he's doing after a little bit. Matt is the project manager on the project. Look at that, and he's down in the trench. That's a beautiful thing. That man knows how to work. Lead him by example, Chafee. We don't call him Action Jackson for no reason. Look at him go, sharpening his pencil. Precise lines, use of a torpedo level. Exact measurements, this wall is gonna look nice. I mean, you start getting the preliminary layouts, an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch off, couple degrees of slop, and the final product represents that. As Coach John Wooden said, success is in the details. We've mentioned in previous videos that Jefferson Electric, as a team, as a fleet, is committed to entirely cordless, battery-operated tools. One of the really important things that you want to discuss with a customer prior to installation day is inclusions and exclusions. For instance, obviously we've damaged his beautiful yard with a massive trench and tire tracks. Who's going to take care of that? Who's responsible for repair? If we have to cut drywall inside the house, if we have to core a hole through the side of the house and mortar repairs required, who's going to execute that? I always advise if your team can execute with excellence, go ahead and maintain control of your project. You control the timing, you control the cost, but uh, in this case, turf repair and drywall repair are not two things that we will perform as a solar energy contractor. We will outsource those, we can help coordinate, we can recommend, but we do not self-perform them. At this point, we've penetrated the roof in an intentional location between the ribs and far enough away from the ribs that our metal roof boot or witch's hat will have enough ready. space to be able to secure to the flat portion of the roof. I'm applying a butyl rope to the witch's hat. That butyl rope is going to be the waterproofing. The witch's hat has a ribbed under surface and so it really allows things to seat. That butyl rope is going to mold into those ribs and marry to the witch's hat as one. If you're a roofer and you have things that I can benefit from related to your experience on this project, please drop a comment below. Now I'm using a gasketed barn style screw to penetrate the roof boot. And I'm gonna work my way around the perimeter, increasing the density of the screws as I go, but I wanna make sure it's sitting and lying flat and flush to the roof. But what I don't wanna do is have anything inhibit my waterproof connection between the gasket on my screw and the witch's hat itself. The screws will end up not more than one inch apart around the entire perimeter. Everything deserves a visual inspection upon completion. It's important to treat a customer's roof with respect. In the case of a metal roof, every nick and scratch will become a rust spot and eventually will rust through. That's the nature of that protective coating and how vital it is. So treat it with respect. At this point, we're gonna use triangulation to square the rails. Triangulation is a foolproof method. If you execute the method of triangulation with caution, you will have two identical right triangles and your rail ends will be perfectly square. You can measure from the edge of the roof, you can use a visual reference point, but sometimes those are not reliable. It's probably best to triangulate and then also reference. We're utilizing an accessory rail to level the rails on the rooftop. 
Level rails, square rails all contribute to an aesthetically pleasing finished product. I highly recommend both steps for any professional project. At this point you get a view into the rest of the Solar Edge technology that's being utilized. See the inverters in the house in the basement that Drew hung? Those are Solar Edge inverters and they are required to be combined with Solar Edge DC to DC converters, also known as optimizers. The optimizers are those little black electronic devices. They're called module level power electronics secured to the rails. The wiring and the power go through the power optimizers and they are constantly performing the Ohm's law power equation to optimize the output. See the optimal switching point from DC to AC is 370 volts. That's the first function of the optimizer to achieve the optimal switching point and maximize the efficiency of the system. Second function of the optimizer is rapid shutdown. Rapid shutdown is the ability for the array during a power outage of any sort, let's say the fire department rolls out, pulls the meter, power goes down, the array must bring itself down to a wet location touch safe voltage within a specified period of time. And that specification is going to depend on the iteration of the code that your local jurisdiction has adopted. Less than 30 volts DC is considered a wet location touch safe voltage. See if the sun is shining, you've got to be able to bring that voltage down either in an emergency or also for safe serviceability. Power optimizers also identify each and every solar module on the final layout. See all of this information and every component on the roof will be uploaded to an online platform that's accessible by the installer, the manufacturer, and the customer so that everyone has total visibility on the performance of the array. That's useful for performance, reporting, troubleshooting, warranty and replacement. I highly recommend that every solar array in America from this point forward is installed with module level power electronics. Terminating MC4 connectors. MC4 connectors are designed and rated to be terminated on the end of 10 gauge PV wire. These MC4 connectors come in positive and negative. There's an internal crimp performed by an MC4 crimper and then there's an external plastic housing that needs to be torqued down to spec and fully clicked into the opposite housing. The ladder safety hoist. Back in the day, we did some silly things, carrying modules up ladders, non-OSHA compliant. For several years now, we've had a ladder safety hoist, and it makes all the difference on a project like this. If the project was of a substantially larger scale, we'd be renting a, an articulating boom lift or an extending boom lift, also known as a lull, to bring a pallet of modules right to the roof. But with rental, delivery, and pickup, fuel costs, those things run a little over $1,000. So that cost-benefit analysis needs to be performed in order to justify the investment. Let me dissuade you from being a he-man and attempting to swing, lift, hoist, tall ladders, uh, ladder vaders by yourself. That's a recipe for an injury. Always ask your teammate for help. At the house here, on the exterior, co-located with the meter, we have three disconnects, one of which is paired each with an inverter inside. This is required by the local jurisdiction and is a common requirement across most of the United States. A lockable throw handle solar disconnect. At this point, this is an AC disconnect. The power has gone from the detached accessory structure from the array to the inverter. It's been inverted to AC voltage. The AC voltage is now coming outside passing through this disconnect. This is the point at which each inverter can be independently disconnected for safe servicing or if it becomes non-compliant with the utility standards and is causing frequency or other types of electrical irregularity, the utility has the authority as well as the ability to disconnect it. One debate that solar energy installers have always had is which is the line side? Let me settle that right now. The utility is always the line side of the disconnect even though the logical power flow is from the solar array to the utility because it's a generation and not a load. The reality is the utility is always line side, top side of the disconnect. And that's gonna be the case here as well. Rain tight connectors in order to attempt to keep water out of the exterior conduit. The reason that we have a fuse disconnect located in the center of these three disconnects is because the point of connection in the house is different. There are two 200 amp panels, each 
disconnect on the outside, the left and the right, is going to interconnect as a breaker in one of those 200 amp panels. That breaker is going to be the source of the overcurrent protection. The center disconnect, those fuses, are the overcurrent protection. And the reason for that is the point of connection is a bare claw. It's a supply side connection without overcurrent protection other than the fuses located in the disconnect. The code does regulate and spend an extensive amount of time on the point, type, and rating of solar interconnections. We always take the covers off when we're working so that they don't flop down and smack us on the hands. We're reinstalling the covers now. Each of the terminations will be torqued with a torque screwdriver to the manufacturer's specification, and all of the terminations will be checked with a digital multimeter. Zach is terminating the AC output of inverter number three in the right 200 amp main panel. Inverter output has a line one, black, line two, red, those are your hot conductors, white, which is neutral, and bare copper, which is ground. In this case, grounds and neutrals are common, terminated to the same bar, that's not always the case. Some beautiful workmanship by the electricians who wired the house. Each inverter is a 7.6 kilowatt inverter. That 7.6 refers to the maximum AC output of the inverter. If you're an electrician and you're not familiar with solar energy, there's this mind-blowing concept called DC to AC oversizing. In this case, these inverters can accept 1.5 times the AC nameplate on the DC side. There's rationale. That's a long conversation around that, but most electricians balk and squirm when they first hear that equipment can be taken to 150% of its nameplate rating. And that's because that's the maximum AC output, but not the safe DC operating parameter of the inverter. Zach is terminating the bear claw on the supply side of the service and the main disconnect. Check with your utility company. Not all utility companies and inspectors in the state of Indiana allow this method, but it is code compliant. Zach is utilizing insulated gloves that is the black sleeve that you see at his wrist. Those are the electrical insulated gloves rated up to 1,000 volts AC. And then the leather overglove to protect the electrical insulation value of the underglove. For taller roofs, we would use a hoist bucket on the end of a rope to prevent trips up and down the ladder in order to convey parts from the ground to the roof and back to the ground. Two of my cautions here are wire bending radius. Be mindful of the wire that you're using, whether it's AC wire, DC wire, rooftop, interior, and honor the radius. A wire that is over bent will be prone to failure under stress conditions. Second caution is don't over torque terminations and fasteners. An electrical termination is very important to torque to the proper setting, not under, not over, as well as a mechanical fastener, like these Iron Ridge UFOs, square bolts, and T-bolts. The manufacturer has specified a torque specification for every fastener, and they will perform long-term reliably if that's honored and respected. It may look like we're kind of running and gunning, but we actually have taken quite a bit of time to calibrate each one of our tools in relationship to a torque wrench, and we have a pretty seasoned feel for what that looks like. The final two steps in the solar installation process are commissioning and customer walkthrough. Of course, you've got your putting away tools, cleaning up your trash, but commissioning is when the wiring is pre-tested for open circuit voltage. The commissioning is then energized in the proper sequence. The optimizers and inverter are paired together. Communication to the inverter is established either by Wi-Fi, Zigbee, gateway, or ethernet connection such that the total array, the inverters and optimizers, and all the associated production can be viewed in the remote monitoring portal. At this step, handing off this valuable asset to the customer is the final step. The customer needs to be brought up to speed on safety components and major elements, terminology of the array. See, from time to time, a minor maintenance concern will pop up on a solar array. If that customer understands basic terminology and the locations of the meaningful equipment, often they're able to 
turn off and re-energize a disconnect, for instance, in order to reset an inverter. And this is useful for cost-effective and remote maintenance and timely customer response. That's it. We will be releasing more solar videos. So subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.